Hello everybody, and welcome to the first episode of my developer diaries as I work on this city building game currently called Peasants. This game shares DNA with other city builders such as Banished and Anno, but with a slightly Monty Python spin on it. You play as a lord in control of very stupid peasants, and your goal is to build up a flourishing settlement whilst paying the king and stopping your subjects from killing themselves. For this game, I'm going for a very vibrant, cell shaded look, similar to that of Studio Ghibli and The Breath of the Wild. If you like what you see, please give me a thumbs up and subscribe so you don't miss episode 2. Thank you. Over the course of the development of this game, I want to bring you all along and share with you any successes or failures I have as I build this city builder. This is a genre I've yet to work on, so expect some funky ideas to begin with. If anyone watching is planning on building a similar game, hopefully these dev diaries should provide you with some guidance about what works and what doesn't work. Let's start this first episode off by running you through some of the core systems that I've built, as well as some of the art and effects, including the new depth of field system. All of the systems you see here are built entirely in blueprints. I don't plan to write any code for this project if possible. And with that, Let's dive in. The first thing I'm going to show you is the post processing I use in the game um, and how this gives me the cell shaded outline look. At the minute, I have four different post process materials applied and I'll run you through what each of these does. But first, let's see what the game looks like without any of these enabled. As you can see, the game looks completely different. The reason for this is that all the lighting information is calculated inside the post process materials, which gives me this kind of fake lighting. All the information the material really needs is whether a pixel is lit over a certain amount or not. If the pixel is, then we assign it a certain colour. If not, we assign it a different colour. However, one limitation of this is that certain lighting effects, such as fog, can alter this data before it is read. Because of this, the fog that you can see in the game is also fake and is drawn on screen using another post-process material. This screen effect is run before the cell shader material so that it can read the raw lighting data. If it was the other way around, the results you would get would be skewed. With the cell shader material now active, you can see how vibrant the game becomes. All of this is manually configured using linear color curves to give me a 24 hour day night cycle that mimics the real world look. If we take a quick look at how that works before I show you the rest of the post processing, I have curves for six different factors. Sun brightness, the color of a lit pixel, the color of an unlit pixel, how lit does that pixel have to be, the directional light colour and the fog colour. The reason why I also have a directional light and change its colour is because a lot of the UE4 systems still need a light to work and use the data from that light. The values for all of these six factors are keyframed using curves based on the time of the day. This is a really powerful system to use if you want a more controlled visual look especially if you're going for a more cell shaded cartoony or an abstract visual style. You have complete control over how everything looks and you have the ability to really make some parts of your game stand out. Going back to the post process, the next material I have applied is a barely noticeable outline shader. If we look at the game before the outline is applied, um, you can probably tell that it's sometimes hard to read the depth of objects. And because we have such a flat but bold visual style, objects can blend into one another. You can really see this issue in the trees in the distance. The last post process material we have in our array of materials is the outline shader. This is used primarily for gameplay reasons, such as when the player interacts with a building or to give the player information such as an invalid build location, including outlining any objects that might be preventing the build. 
The next thing I'd like to show you is the safe game system that I implemented. The concept for this is pretty simple and revolves around a safe game component and parent actor which listens out for events and saves the relevant data. Inside the save game object we have a collection of functions to handle the saving and loading of data. Each of these functions is called by the relevant blueprint and game to store or retrieve information. Data is then organized into structs and we only save what is necessary to avoid bloated file sizes and long loading times. I found using this method gives me the most control while still keeping everything manageable. I try and save as little information as possible and keep the majority of the loading logic inside managers rather than having it in every single little blueprint. When a game is loaded, the blueprints then call the load version of the function, which basically returns the structs back to them. Each blueprint then has to decide what to do with that data, such as creating new objects or setting variables. It's good practice when using blueprint communication in UE4 to try and keep as much of it as possible in interfaces. This way you don't have to reference other blueprints from blueprints. The majority of the safe load logic occurs inside this blueprint component. The power of using a component to store this logic is that the component can be added to pretty much any other blueprint so we can share as much logic as possible. The component listens out for save load events, which are called from the game mode when the player triggers them, or when the autosave kicks in. We listen out for this by registering to event dispatches and executing logic when they are called. To further increase the efficiency of sharing logic, most actors in the game that will save derive from a single save load blueprint. This stores all the logic that it needs to communicate with the save load component as well as having overridable events that trigger when a save or load happens. The last thing I want to show you today is the depth of field system I've been working on. Again, a pretty straightforward system but it gives me what I need. The way it works is by using a sphere trace from the camera's position straight forward. Based on the information we get from this trace, we change the camera's focus settings and aperture settings. The reason I use a sphere trace is because we don't know exactly what the player is looking at, so we try and grab whatever is roughly in the middle of the screen and what occupies a large amount of screen space. When using a line trace before, I was running into issues where the line would miss geometry or go through staircases for example and provide a nasty effect. I also changed the aperture, which in layman's terms is what affects the amount of depth of field, based on how close the camera is to the object. This mimics what would happen in real life and means we don't get any of that annoying depth of field when the camera is zoomed out. Here you can see the settings I use and I also applied some hackery here by spawning an object, placing that object in the world at the location the player is looking at and then using the camera tracking settings to track that object automatically. And as I said before, then I also changed the aperture of the camera. Well, that's it for the first dev diary. This is just the start of a long journey and I hope you all come back for episode two. If you have anything you would like me to talk about in particular in that episode, please comment down below. And thanks for joining me and I look forward to seeing you next time. Peace.